Good morning. We are starting our last day in Istanbul at the Blue Mosque. And I just want to share one fact with you that we learned on our tour yesterday. This particular mosque has six minarets, which are like the towers. And at the time it was built, there was, I guess, the most impressive or important mosque in Saudi Arabia. And that one also had six minarets. And so when this one was built with six, it was very controversial because it was important to ensure that all other mosques built around the world were not as big or deemed as important as the one in Saudi Arabia. And the Sultan who built this one didn't really care. And when they kind of pointed it out to him, he was like, well, I've spent a lot of money building this mosque. So he ended up just donating a bunch of money so that a seventh minaret was built on the one in Saudi Arabia, making it the biggest and most important still. And apparently that mosque now has nine minarets, but anyway, just thought it was an interesting story. And it's interesting because there is such a thing as a Sultan mosque in comparison to most other mosques. Generally speaking, even if it's a large public mosque, you see no more than two minarets. However, because the Sultan enjoyed grandeur and obviously had a lot of money to throw around at the time, then normally speaking, if you see any more than two, especially in Turkey, then that is a sign that the Sultan decided to build it. For now, let's go see all the blue tile work that everyone raves and talks about. So that was incredible. When we first went into a huge mosque, then that was when we were in Morocco in Casablanca, seeing the Hassan II mosque. But the layout, the overall design was completely different. The mosque in Morocco was really more, it felt more like a church or like a castle. And that is basically just, it seemed like to be a really long, very tall, elevated building. Whereas with this, then, there's a lot of domes and cupolas, which you can see there. And so really the, the emphasis seems to be more on kind of keeping the building square so that the focus is really on the circles that are meant to represent what the heavens mm -hmm. and God and all that kind of thing. So it's just really interesting to see kind of the differences in design. But I think the other thing is that we, well personally, I feel pretty lucky because we were told by our tour guide yesterday that inside the Blue Mosque, they've been renovating that for four years. And because of the fact that there was an election this week, then they decided that they were going to make sure that it was all sorted out and all ready for visitors now. So for the past like three days, I think, then we've had a complete unspoiled view of the interior, which has been a genuine privilege. It meant that we got to see everything and that was just so great. Yeah, it was absolutely spectacular. I think that's the only word I can use. I just had this feeling of calm inside. And I think that's what they were saying. It was supposed to be serene, which is why they use the color blue. Now, funny enough, as 
amazing and gorgeous as the tile work is. Yes, I would say blue is the dominant color, but I actually thought it would be far more blue than it was. I found it just to be very colorful. The stained glass was gorgeous. Just the whole thing. It was so beautiful. It was. It's an interesting thing though, because I'm not sure if you noticed, but certainly on some of the pillars that were there, then you notice that a lot of the tile work was actually quite faded, but there were a few that they properly restored to their full color. And so you could see the contrast as to kind of how vibrant the color was in its original form versus how it is now. Because at the end of the day, this mosque, I think was built 400 years ago. And so of course, like there has to be some elements of renovation work that need to be done over time. Uh, but it had only partially been done when we were visiting. So yeah, got to see that. And that was just, again, another fascinating part of this amazing building. The Turkish people don't actually call it the Blue Mosque. That's a name that tourists gave it because of the tile work. I believe it's actually Sultan Ahmed yeah. Mosque. And another thing to note about the mosques here is that they're all free. So if someone is offering you a skip the line ticket, it doesn't exist. They are all free to enter. You just have to cover your knees and your shoulders and women your hair. Yep. But another interesting thing we learned yesterday on the tour is that it was never just a mosque that the Ottomans built. It was always kind of like a center. So it would include maybe a hospital, a school, a hammam, a bazaar. Sometimes a tomb for the Sultan, mm -hmm. if it was built by a Sultan or a Sultan's family member. It essentially was just a large kind of community-based complex yeah. rather than just a place of worship. And I think that was something that the Sultanate was very much known for. Mm. Kind of any members of the Sultan's family, one of the things that they would do as a philanthropic work would be to build huge community buildings for the purposes of helping the people. I think we're going to head right across the street or whatever you call it to Hagia Sophia now. So it'll be interesting to see, I guess, the differences between the two mosques. Well, and Hagia Sophia also, it was a church when the Romans were ruling, but then when the Ottomans took over, they made it a mosque. So it'll really be interesting to see what the differences are between the two, considering Hagia Sophia has had a few lives. Mm -hmm. I think he also mentioned yesterday, our tour guide, that it also at one point was a museum, so. Indeed. By contrast to this, which is only 400 years old, Hagia Sophia is 1500 years mm. old. So it'll be really interesting to see just how much of the original stuff is standing and just get to check out the evolution of it over time. Yeah, let's go.
was definitely a contrast to what we saw in the Blue Mosque. I found Hagia Sophia much darker in color, like it was grays and blacks, but I also found the architecture in there so layered because of the fact that it has been reconstructed by so many different cultures and empires. So that was really interesting. Also, you may have noticed in the footage that it's in a bit of rougher shape than the Blue Mosque. I mean, not all of the walls and ceilings have been restored. There's parts that are kind of like very black and parts that are like white and empty, kind of like they've been scraped. And then the other interesting thing is that in the prayer section, they have covered all of the Christian artwork and so on, like Virgin Mary and Jesus, whereas in the rest of the mosque, they have kind of just left it be and added Islamic decorations or Islamic religious art to it. And I think that was done because eventually it was decided that they wanted to preserve this long history and the transformation that the building went through. So they decided just to cover the Christian artwork in the specific prayer section. I have heard a lot about Hagia Sophia in particular, and so I was very, very excited to go, and I wasn't disappointed. I think having gotten the context of the history of the number of transformations it's gone through over as many years as a structure, it's just so great that you get to see parts of pretty much every iteration. You get to see some of the stonework from when it was originally built, and then some of the additional layers and layers and layers, both on the exterior and also on the interior. And they kind of keep some of the old stonework as well, some of which has like ancient Greek inscriptions, so that you can see some of the parts of what used to be as well. So for me, really, that is a true time capsule. It's a time capsule of how this region has developed over time under each of the different civilizations that it's been ruled by and owned by over time. And honestly, I was just blown away by it. Really, really cool. I think the other thing is that in the Blue Mosque, I said that it was this calm and serene feeling, mm -hmm. whereas you don't get that in there, whereas or I didn't at least. And you described it really well. You said it was opulent mm -hmm. in a more church-like fashion yes. which makes complete sense because mm -hmm. it was a church and so it definitely has characteristics that resemble european italian churches that we've been seeing in italy and so on as opposed to the blue mosque which is really just like a totally different structure and definitely reminded me more of the type of mosque we saw in morocco yeah 100 percent. i think realistically like when you do realize this was initially built as a church rather than anything else and then it became the seat of the orthodox christianity as well and then you compare that to other places we've been to like St. Mark's Basilica and things like that which is also built in the same style then you start to get a sense of how churches in that time were intended to look so all in all it was just really cool I think this has been a fantastic way to spend a morning. My cousin is actually also in Turkey at the moment, coincidentally. So we're going to go and meet up with her and see what we get up to.
nice. You in Canada. We are at Top Cappy Palace. When we came, the queue was basically to the end of the path, but actually it's moved pretty quickly. I think it only took us about 20 minutes to get seen to. There are two types of tickets. So you have one which includes the palace, the Hagia Irene, which I think is like the Monuments Museum, and also the Harem. That is for 650. We opted for the one without the Harem, which is 500 lira. And the good news is they also accept cards, so we didn't have to worry about cash, so that's great. The next step is to get a free audio guide, which does come included. You just have to put a deposit down, which is some form of ID, be it a passport, ID card, or driver's license. So we're going to sort ourselves out with that now, and then we're going to go in. are some of the vessels that they used to store food in the palace's pantry. Before tables were used, they used to have meals around these dining mats. This is the beautiful confectionery kitchen where fruit preserves, desserts, and syrups were made.
a sword made for Nick's size. Bloody massive. Absolutely bloody massive. It was just vast. Which obviously shows just how wealthy the song truly was. But I think it was also interesting because it gave you a bit more of an insight into just what it was like to be on a palace that is really that vast. Like I think in terms of sort of size, dimensions, the reverence of the Sultan, all of that kind of stuff, I think it really is comparable to Versailles in a lot of ways. But I think what we found was that with Versailles, then you know everything is basically kept intact and restores to what it used to be back in those times. Whereas with this then, you might have something which used to be a treasury, but it's then been converted into a museum for armor. It might be the Sultan's quarters, but then it's all of the sacred relics and things like that that the Sultan had collected over time. Can I just interrupt and say how interesting the holy relics was? Because mm -hmm. they would say, oh, this is the prophet David's sword mm -hmm. or the prophet Moses's staff or St. John the Baptist's arm or uh muhammad's pretty, beard hair pretty wild claims like i mean don't get me wrong if any of them actually stand up to historical facts then incredible to have seen them but you kind of question with all of the relics that we have seen just during our time traveling over the last month just how many of them are the real deal mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, a lot of it was not really in its original state. There were a few rooms that maybe were, but a lot of it had, had been like gutted out or repurposed to show exhibits about something that is completely different from what it used to be. So that was a little bit interesting. But I think in terms of what it did cover, it was really comprehensive. It didn't just look at the Sultanate and royalty, but it also looked at how the Ottoman Empire was run in terms of its administration, what happened with its importance on education, where did people go for that, where were the books held, all of that kind of thing. And then on top of that, that then kind of made its way down all the way to the servants, the cooking staff, all of that kind of thing. So really, if you want a complete guide to exactly what life at that palace was like, then really that is the best way to find out about it. Because I don't think I've seen a palace that really is that comprehensive about all parts of living there. It definitely took a while. It is now just about... It's 5.45 and we arrived at 2 o'clock. Yep. So I feel like we didn't even see everything that's how big it is and we could have easily spent another hour or hour and a half there but i also don't feel like we missed out on anything no i think touching on what you said i made the comment to nick that it wasn't what i expected it to be mm. and he said well what do you mean what did you expect it to be and Nick, you said it with Versailles, is that because it wasn't in its original state, Yeah. it wasn't what I expected. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I still did learn about what the original use of the rooms and buildings were. Yeah. As you said, whether it was a school, a library, a sultan's quarters, a hammam, mm -hmm. a treasury, or we actually got to even see, so how it's laid out is you go into like the public area yeah. of the palace first. And so you get to see what were the old kitchens and I believe where the servants quarters were. Mm -hmm. And then they have exhibits of the kitchen wares and the dishware in that area. Yeah. And then I think they also had an exhibit, as you said, on weapons mm -hmm. and there was an exhibit on fashion and clothing and they had something to do with calligraphy. There was just so much to see. And then you basically go into the private quarters and oh, 
then I think they had an exhibit there on like jewelry. Everything, this was the other thing, is even with weapons, everything was so decorated. There was care taken and detail and there was a story in every sword or every mace or every rifle that was made. It wasn't just functional, it was also beautiful. Don't get me wrong, when we ended up paying the entrance fee of 500 lira each, we did think we'd been robbed a little bit blind, but actually, if you really took the time over every single part of it, then actually, I feel like you could probably make a full day of it if you really wanted to, so... Yeah, and then $35 doesn't really seem so unreasonable. No. I mean, even for three and a half hours, mm -hmm. but the fact that you could potentially spend like five hours there, yeah, you could, you could really get your money's worth if you wanted to, just by spending a day at Top Cafe Palace. So certainly I feel happier for having gone. Yeah, I agree. It was definitely a learning experience. Mm -hmm. 100%. But I think that's about it. We're yeah. Gonna, we're going to be leaving Istanbul tomorrow. How do you feel about that? I'm sad, but I'm excited to move on as well. And I feel like we've seen a lot of Istanbul. I feel like we've really done a good job of getting a feel for the city, so. That's true. We've checked out a lot of neighborhoods. We've got to see a lot of the major sites. We've even been over to the Asian side of the city on top of that. So I would go as far as to say that we've done a pretty good job of seeing everything that we wanted to see and everything that we quote unquote should see. Yeah, we've had a comprehensive three days. Exactly. But I do absolutely love this place. I think it's fascinating. There's such a rich history here and a massive melting pot of kind of just everything that I've just historically enjoyed when I've traveled. Genuine treat to be here, but we'll look ahead to traveling through Turkey over the next 10 days or so. Yeah, it was nice to learn more about a history that I didn't feel like I had heard enough about before. Mm -hmm. I think what we're gonna do is head to the grocery store to pick up food for tonight. And also we have a basically full day bus journey tomorrow. So we need to make sure that we're fed for that. Yep, I think that's gonna probably make up the rest of our day. So I guess that's it for now. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.